since the last class we started discussing about heteronuclear correlation. I discussed about what is heteronuclear correlation, a very basic pulse sequence where we can correlate any two different heteronuclei, proton carbon, proton nitrogen, proton fluorine, etcetera. But it could be abundant to abundant spin, abundant or dilute spin, whatever it is. We can do heteronuclear correlation. And I explain to you how heteronuclear correlation works in a simple pulse sequence. We apply upon any like the proton pulse, bring the magnetization to x-axis and then allow it to evolve for some time. After the T1 period, do an inept so that you create an antiphase magnetization for the proton, antiphase coherence and then simultaneously apply to 90 percent proton and carbon, the coherence jumps from proton to carbon and it at carbon. It is a very simple experiment to understand, but it also is very easy to interpret. And I said heterocar experiment, heterocar correlation do not have diagonals and do not are not symmetric because the chemical shift of different ranges are different. For different nuclei they have different chemical shift ranges. So, the two dimensions are entirely different and there is no question of any symmetry or diagonal. Okay, that is a one uh, these are the few advantages and the interpretation is very simple. Put a sit on a peak in a Hetkar experiment, go at vertically up and horizontally. If this is the vertically when you go up if that is a proton axis you get a chemical sheet of proton for that peak and go horizontally if it is a carbon axis then you are going to get a carbon chemical shift. For example, if it is a CA3 group you go vertically up you get CA3 proton chemical shift, go horizontally you get CA3 carbon chemical shift and I showed one or two examples how we can interpret it very easily. But there is one drawback with this, Hetkar is a direct detection of the X nuclei that could be very time consuming. Then new experiment <coughs> has been in, uh, has been uh, invented and discovered over the years people start doing different type of experiment to speed up the experiment and get better signal to noise ratio and they are called inverse experiments. So, I will today from today start discussing about inverse experiments. Okay. So, in the inverse experiment as main problem I told you the direct de detection of X nuclei is less sensitive. Remember in the very first class or second class when I was discussing about sensitivity of detection of NMR signal, I said X proton is let us say is highly abundant and you know compared to any other nuclei with highest gamma and is more uh, more sensitive. And carbon 13 compared to that I said 6000 times nearly smaller, less sensitive. And if I want to detect the carbon 13 directly, it is even more difficult because it is less sensitive, abundance is small. So, as a consequence that will take enormous amount of time. On the other hand, why cannot we detect X nuclei indirectly through proton? It is something funny. Uh, instead of detecting carbon, why should I detect proton indirectly? There is a way we can do that. In the, the advantage of that if, if I do that, we are not detecting carbon, we are detecting proton. That means, gamma is high for proton sensitivity is 4 times larger than that of carbon, the experiment is faster, but how we do is a challenge we will do that. So, direct detection of X nuclei may take let us say few hours, 10 hours, 15 hours experiment whereas, inverse detection experiment will take half an hour to 1 hour. See the saving in the instrument time, saving in your experimental time, there is enormous saving in the experimental time because we are not directly detecting the X nuclei. How do we do that? It is a very simple way. We do the polarization transfer through inept. This is always done from abundant spins to rare spin, dilute spin. Abundant spin if we let us say take proton and carbon, abundant spin is proton, I give his magnetization to carbon. Then I detect carbon, so then again we are detecting carbon that is a problem. What we will do is you will take the magnetization of proton and give it to carbon and take it back from proton again um, take it back from carbon to proton again. You understand the project problem give the magnetization for proton to carbon and take it back. In this process I am detecting proton, but in this process I get the information about carbon 13 is the advantage. Directly I am detecting proton high sensitive nuclei saving experimental time, but I also get the in information about dilute spins. This is an advantage and of course, I can do the decoupling experiment and get the do the 
కపల్ ఎక్స్పెరిమెంట్ డీ కపల్ హెచ్ఎస్ ఇన్వర్స్ ఎక్స్పెరిమెంట్ ఎవ్రీథింగ్ కెన్ బిడ్ దట్స్ ఆల్ వెల్ నోన్ సో ఇది ఇన్వర్స్ ఎక్స్పెరిమెంట్ ఇన్ ది టూ డైమెన్షనల్ ఎక్స్పెరిమెంట్ యూజువలీ డిటెక్షన్ డైమెన్షన్ ఈజ్ ప్రోటాన్ బికాస్ ఐఎమ్ డైరెక్ట్లీ డిటెక్టింగ్ ప్రోటాన్ దట్ ఈస్ సెన్సిటివ్ న్యూక్లియర్ ఇఫ్ ఇట్ డిటెక్ట్ కార్బన్ థర్టీన్ దెన్ ఇట్ ఇస్ నాట్ సెన్సి నో ఇట్ ఈస్ నాట్ ఇన్వర్స్ ఎక్స్పెరిమెంట్ ఇట్ ఇస్ అ డైరెక్ట్ డిటెక్షన్ ఇట్ ఇస్ లైక్ హెట్కార్ దట్ విల్ టేక్ మోర్ టైమ్ సో ఐ ఇన్ ది ఇన్వర్స్ ఎక్స్పెరిమెంట్ డిటెక్షన్ డైమెన్షన్ ఈజ్ ఆల్వేస్ ప్రోటాన్ దట్ సేవ్స్ టైమ్ ఓకే అండ్ వీ హ్యావ్ నెంబర్ ఆఫ్ ఎక్స్ ఎక్స్పెరిమెంట్స్ ఆర్ దేర్ విచ్ హ్యావ్ బీన్ డిస్ విచ్ హ్యావ్ బీన్ డిజైన్ ఫర్ ఎగ్జాంపుల్ హెచ్ఎంక్యూసీ హెట్రోనిక్లర్ మల్టిపల్ క్వాంటమ్ కోహరెన్స్ హెచ్ఎస్క్యూసీ హెట్రోనిక్లర్ సింగిల్ క్వాంటమ్ కోహరెన్స్ హెచ్ఎంబిసి హెట్రోనిక్లియర్ మల్టిపల్ బాండ్ కోహరెన్స్ దీస్ ఆర్ సమ్ ఆఫ్ ది కామన్ హెట్రోనిక్లియర్ కార్డినేషన్ ఎక్స్పెరిమెంట్స్ జనరలీ ఎంప్లాయిడ్ for analyzing the spectrum what does hsqc does hsqc gives connectivity between directly coupled heteronuclei and it uses one bond heteronuclear coupling for example in a molecule like this assume one bond coupling is 150 hertz that is only for experimental purpose to set up in a molecule like this i can get a correlation between this carbon and this proton or this carbon and this proton doesn't matter this carbon this proton this carbon this proton i can get the correlation information one bond directly bond that is hsqc and it uses the concept that there is a one bond coupling between carbon and proton j you know heteronuclear j coupling indirect coupling and this can be any new. i took the example of carbon does not make it mean it is only for carbon and proton you can have a carbon proton hsqc nitrogen 15 hsqc any other nuclei dilute spin to any other abundant spin one of them should be abundant spin because you have to do the polarization transfer and detecting that nuclei as a sensitive nuclei so you can have fluorine nitrogen fluorine carbon all sorts of hsqc experiments are possible if i do nitrogen 15 i can get the correlation between one bond proton and uh, nitrogen and proton one bond carbon proton in the variety of such experiments are possible of course i also said one more hsqc and hmqc and hmbc three experiment what is the difference between hsqc and hmqc one is multiple quantum co- co- to the multiple quantum by pathway we adapt other is hsqc single quantum both of them provide identical information la small difference is there in hmqc we will h- we will also get hh coupling there will be some uh, homonuclear couplings among protons may also evolve so small difference is there in the observation as far as the appearance of the spectrum is concerned except some couplings like hh coupling others will uh, also come through as far as the heteronuclear correlation information is concerned both of them give identical information and if there are any differences between them it is only small subtle differences are there okay let us see what about the long range couplings in carbon 13 you can also get fair like take the carbon 13 in the nmr spectrum i can get three bond coupling like this i can get three bond two bond two bond like this varieties of long range couplings are possible how do you correlate them is there any way i can correlate in the hsqc i said directly one bond you know coupling between carbon and proton if it is there i'll carp i'll correlate only directly connected head to nuclei what about long range coupling with if this proton if it correlates to this in a molecule like this can is it possible so not this one this long range yes it is possible that is called heteronuclear multiple bond correlation that means several bonds are remotely coupled the pro- between two nuclei proton and or abundant spin other spin remotely coupled can be correlated then what do you use here in the hsqc we use one bond carbon proton coupling one bond coupling is needed for getting the correlation information in the hmbc we use long range correlation two bond or three bond which is from 0 to 10 hertz similarly if i take ch coupling two bond is also about 10 to 15 hertz so this is also 10 to 15 0 to 10 hertz like that so we use long range coupling constant to correlate protons and carbons which are remotely coupled long range correlation for example in a molecule like this 
HSQC, I told you, it will give direct correlation like this. But HMBC gives correlation of this carbon to this proton, this carbon to this proton, and this carbon to even this proton, 1, 2, 3 months away. And each carbon, this can give to this, like that. Varieties of correlations you can think of. HMBC can give long range correlations of very thing. One carbon to many other protons, now uh, 2 bond, 3 bond separated also. HMQC makes use of multiple quantum pathway during evolution. That is the only difference. HMQC is slightly different from HSQC and HMBC. The, the only thing is, in the case of HSQC and HMBC, we use inept for polarization transfer. During evolution time, we use inept. So, that is the advantage. We will gain here. Polarization transfer is there. So, the, it, normally, HMQC, very few, very few people use very rarely. HSQC and HMBC are commonly employed experiments. So, we will start uh, discussing HSQC, HMBC over it, in this class for some time. Try to take lot of examples. So, HMBC gives cross peaks between protons and carbon that are 2 or 3 bonds away. And then you may ask me a question. If I have a molecule like this and I have proton here and this proton here, this can give correlation to this. This can give correlation. Whatever is directly bonded, that is also there. Will it not give a correlation? Will it not confuse us? Then we do an experiment. We design the experiment in such a way the direct one bond correlation peaks are suppressed. We will remove this one. Retain only long range correlations. One bond direct correlations we suppress and long range correlations are re retained. That is what is done in HMBC. That is why it is called heteronuclear multiple bond. Multiple bond means separated by multiple bonds, remotely bonded. That correlation we can do. One bond directly bonded or suppressed. They are removed. So, HMQC experiment few subtle points to understand you. Uh, subtle point is HMQC experiment is more robust as far as chemical experiment in imperfections and miscalibration is, miscalibration is concerned. For example, slight deviation from 90 degree pulses, etc. There is an imperfection in the pulse exper experiment. HMQC is okay, tolerable. HSQC is more favorable when we want high resolution work. That is another imp information. You see, HSQC, if you want very high resolution, because HMQC generally gives broad signal because of HH coupling which are coming into the picture that will broaden the signal unless of course there are ways to remove the HH coupling by using several type of experiment I will uh, if there is a time I will discuss that also. But remember that usually gives broad signal because of uh, homonuclear coupling by among protons or also coming into the picture. So, HSQC gives high resolution more favorable for that and suppression of the resonance another important thing is we have to do. When I am correlating the carbon 13 with proton, I have to correlate this one with proton. But remember, carbon 12 is highly abundant 99 percent. That is what I said. If I do an N15 uh, proton correlation, nitrogen 15, nitrogen 14 is also there. That is 99 percent abundant. They give huge peaks. Somehow, we have to reduce this. There could be signal coming from protons attached to carbon 12 and N14 abundant spins. We need to suppress them. Otherwise, very difficult to get correlation of less abundant carbon 13 to proton because these huge peaks will interfere. How do you suppress that? There are ways of suppressing this. One way is by phase cycling. Other way is by gradients. There are two, three ways. Two, uh, these two things we will discuss today. So, we can we have to suppress protons signal bound to carbon 12 or nitrogen 14 by using either phase cycling or gradients. Okay. Uh, when we I talk about the heteronuclear experiments like HSQC, HMBC, HMQC, you may ask me a question, are there any analogous Direct detection experiments? Of course, is there. HSQC is HMQC is nothing but Hetkar experiment. I check very first thing which we discussed yesterday or in the previous class about Hetkar experiment. That is a direct detection experiment 
analog goes to HSQC. HSQC is faster because of polarization transfer, saves time, otherwise identical. What about remotely bonded HMPC experiment? I did not explain, but is there any identical experiment for direct detection? Of course, it is there and that is called COLAC, correlation of long range carbons. So, long range correlation is there. It is, this is analogous to HMPC. There are also direct experiments, analogous to HSQC experiments, you know, inverse experiments, but direct experiment because nobody does this test. So, that is I am not discussing, but I will uh, give you some information about coupled and decoupled carbon 13 HSQC. HSQC experiment when we do, we can do different type of experiment. This has been modified over years by various workers in the field. We can have a different type of experiment. We can get coupled HSQC, we can do decoupled HSQC and decoupling in F1 dimension, coupling in F2 dimension, decoupling F2 dimension, coupling in F1 dimension or decoupling in both the dimensions, varieties of experiments are possible. We will discuss what is coupled and decoupled carbon 13 proton HSQC. Okay. I can do 1H decoupling in the T1, which removes multiplicity in the F1 dimension. I can do carbon 13 decoupling in the T2, again it removes multiplicity. Either way I can do individually or I can do both or I can do nothing and get the coupling information in both the dimensions. Everything is possible. We will understand that what is that experiment by taking a simple bond, CH bond a simple assume hypothetical case we have carbon 13 and proton take for example chcl3 in chcl3 you have carbon and proton directly bonded forget about cl3 this is a ch bond i have written what are the types of experiment we can do hsqc i'll show here i'll take the 1h spectrum of that first what do you get we all know if I take CHCl3, one spectrum gives a single peak, this one. This is from 99 percent of the molecule coming because of carbon 12 attached to proton. That is carbon 12 is NMR inactive, but only proton were detecting no coupling. Whatever 1 percent of the molecule which has got carbon 13, that is here carbon 13 coupled to proton, one molecule is there, 1 percent that will become a doublet because of coupling with proton and that is what the peaks we are getting here. They are I told you already they are called satellites. So, if I take the proton spectrum of this CHCl3 molecule, we get one peak for C C12H attached pro proton and two satellite peaks for carbon 13 attached protons. So, that is how it is. We go to the next one. If I detect carbon 13, of course, this directly gives you one bond J proton carbon coupling. What about carbon detection? It will give only a doublet. As I said, when I am det det detecting the dilute spin, the question of satellites does not arise. I am directly detecting carbon 13. So, it will be coupled to proton, it will be just a doublet of equal intensity. So, if I detect the carbon 13 spectrum of this hypothetical molecule, we get a doublet intensity 50 50 because it is split into a doublet. Now, what is the separation giving you? This gives you J coupling between carbon and proton. All right. Now, I will do one thing I will do the detection of proton with carbon 13 decoupling. What will happen? I break this coupling carbon proton coupling that will not be there I remove it I told you about decoupling long back. So, when I do the decoupling carbon proton coupling is broken and we get only a singular peak. So, this peak is already 99 percent intensity with this it will become 100 percent intensity it adds to that you get a single peak by breaking carbon 13 coupling. What about this molecule? Here I am detecting carbon 13 and I do proton decoupling. So, these two doublet will collapse into a singlet 50 50 percent intensity will go this will become 100 percent intensity for one peak. This is what we can do. We can do 
detect proton, do carbon-13 decoupling, I can detect carbon-13 and do proton decoupling. Both the experiments are possible. Now, you let us use this and see how many types of HSQC experiment we can do. Look at this, in, in this dimension we have carbon-13, in this dimension we have protons. I will consider a situation like this, coupled experiment I am not decoupling in either dimension. What does it mean? I will get like previous example, if I look for proton NMR I get carbon coupling, if I look carbon NMR I get proton carbon couplings. So, both are possible. In this dimension for proton carbon 13 satellites are there, 1 jch. In this dimension for carbon simply split into a doublet. I get carbon 13 proton coupling. So, this is the situation in both the dimension they are coupled carbon and proton are coupled. So, this is a called a coupled HSQC when I do an experiment this is called coupled HSQC experiment. I can do one thing I can decouple in the F 1 dimension which is F 1 dimension this one written here. I can decouple in this dimension and then get the coupling in the F 2 dimension. So, when I decouple the F 1 dimension what will happen? These doublets will collapse into singlet. So, we get a singlet at the center whereas, this coupling is maintained. So, this is in this dimension is still a doublet only in this dimension a doublet is removed and you are going to get a singlet exactly at the center because coupling is removed. This is called an experiment where decoupling is done in the F 1 dimension coupling is retained in the F 2 dimension. What is the next possibility? We can think of a situation decoupling in the F 2 coupling in F 1 decoupling only in the F 2 what is F 2 this one if I decouple in this dimension this coupling is broken and you get a peak exactly at the center because this dimension I am still retaining the coupling. This is called decoupling in the F 2 dimension. What is the next possibility? Decouple in both the dimensions. Then what will happen? This dimension, this will be, uh, this dimension will collapse into a singlet, and this dimension will collapse into a singlet. You get only a peak exactly at the center, one peak. This is what we saw in the Hetkar experiment. When we try to interpret, we always saw one contour, and we went vertically up and horizontally and analyzed and identified proton and carbon chemical shifts. That is what normally is done. This is a decoupled experiment decoupled in both F 1 and F 2 dimensions. Okay, then, how do you do this? You have got the idea now how we can do the decoupling experiment. We can have varieties of possible experiment depending upon the information that you want to derive. We can have different experiments. <laughs> All right. Let us understand what is the basic HSQC pulse sequence. What is the basic HSQC pulse sequence? this much you know already. What is this? It is a inept sequence. We have seen that already we understood 90 on the proton with two delays which we have to man man manipulate with respect to JCH and simultaneous 180 on this and then simultaneous 90 on this to you know transfer the coherence from proton to carbon and detect. That is what we saw that that is a inept experiment where there is a polarization transfer takes place that is called inept. And then in the heteronuclear spin echo I told you if you apply 90 pulse on only one of them what will happen? You can break the coupling because that the J coupling will refocus that is what I said. Applying a 180 pulse in one, one of the channel in the heteronuclear experiment means you are breaking the coupling you are doing decoupling pulse decoupling you are doing. Then afterwards what happened this is exactly reversed here. See, same thing we came came like this. Now we are going backwards. What do you call this one? This is inept sequence, and this is reverse inept. You that means you brought the magnetization proton to carbon, decoupling, and then take it back like this. So it is called a reverse inept. So HSQC is a combination of inept with a 180 pulse at the center for the T1 period to evolve, which results in decoupling and then reverse inept this is what it is. We take the magnetization from proton and transfer to carbon 
by inept and then allow it to evolve in the T1 period with a 180 pulse on the center which causes decoupling. It results in decoupling of carbon and proton and then take it back to proton and then start collecting the signal here while collecting that signal you are doing decoupling. Look at this I am collecting the carbon that is signal and decoupling proton. What are you going to get? You get a decoupled carbon 13 spectrum all protons coupled to all the carbons are removed for each chemical in equivalent carbon is at single peak. But in the process what has happened? You have taken the magnetization of proton to carbon decoupled here in the T1 dimension and then take it back. Here you are decoupling. So, T1 dimension also you are decoupling, T2 dimension also you are decoupling. That means like what I showed you in the previous that 4 possibilities you are getting the last one you get only one peak at the center both the dimension coupling is broken and this is what the basic HSQ simple sequence does. Of course, do not worry about this thing this has been discussed in the previous class. And then basic we use a 2 pulse sequence why I told you we have to suppress the carbon peak I mean proton peak coming because of attached to carbon 12 that is important thing we have to suppress that. So, what we do is we use what is called a phase cycle. Phase cycling I did not discuss in this course extensively, but remember in the one of the previous classes my advanced course I discuss about phase cycling, I discuss various things about field pulse field gradient etcetera to select a certain coherent pathway that is what phase cycling does. But anyway without going into the details remember how we do it we do a first 90 degree pulse experiment and then we invert the receiver accordingly and the second experiment we do with 90 minus x and then subtract the take the difference between the two this is what we do. In both HSQC and HMPC experiment what happens the mechanism of polarization transfer is identical does not matter. So, this is what it happens transfer magnetization proton to carbon this is identical for HMPC also proton to carbon allow it to spin the evolve then do the decoupling whatever you want in the T1 period and then reverse inept take the polarization from carbon to back to proton start detecting the X nuclei while doing proton. See we are de detecting proton that is an advantage look at it the sensitivity of the detection here he is you are detecting proton and decoupling carbon 13 that is important thing. So, this is what it is. So, in the H another important point I wanted to tell you is when the HSQC is FID in the recorded all protons induce a signal whether it is carbon 12 or carbon 13 system does not distinguish and the instrument does not distinguish you are going to get the signals from both this thing all protons will give a signal. The unwanted resonance is 99 percent that if you suppress you can efficiently detect the correlation of carbon 13 that is what I said. So, interference of the C12 and N14 peaks have to be suppressed. This is what I said basic 2 pulse sequence 90 pulse experiment as well as with the inversion and then co-addition of the data will suppress the signal corresponding to abundant proton coming from attached to carbon 12 abundant spin. How do you do this? First experiment you do with 90 plus x, second experiment you do with 90 minus x and then each time when you do you change the receiver phase also accordingly. Afterwards do the co-addition of the data. This is what happens I will show you example how it works. Take an experiment one where I am doing an experiment with carbon 13 plus with the first pulse on carbon 13 is plus x. I get a signal like this. This is major thing coming carbon 12 attach proton and I am interested in this satellite peaks huge peak is coming and then that will you know suppress this signal because the major component is coming from the abundant spin or C12 attached to proton that is one thing that is one experiment I will do with first pulse plus x. What I will do another experiment we have first carbon 13 pulse is minus x what happens in that case carbon 13 satellites get inverted like this how it works everything is a different question 
see in the another experiment I do the phase cycling with the here is the plus x pulse is a minus x pulse C 12 signal remains same C 13 signal is inverted because we are looking at C 13 coupling ok. What I will do I will take the difference between these two and I take the difference between these two see this component I am trying to suppress and I get retain only this signal that is intensity will be better now that is what we have to do and that is how we suppress this. This is the way suppression by using what is called phase cycling we suppress this by using phase cycling. But remember this phase cycling does not suppress efficiently look at it is not very efficient it gives uh, some you know artifacts there is some problem to overcome that this another experiment is designed instead of the phase cycling we use gradients here that is an interesting thing see it's everything is remains same but only thing is during this time after the T1 period after 180 pulse we use what is called a sort of a echo like sequence and during this echo time a one pulse is applied and here another pulse is applied during this time gradient pulse that was very important the G1 gradient is applied within the spin echo to refocus that carbon 30 chemical shift and G2 is applied during inept for refocus refocusing inept refocusing period. What happens the first gradient acts when carbon has a coherence p is equal to plus 1 this is what is important here you see here n and p peaks are there coherence plus 1 and minus 1 it is called ok that we discussed extensively in one of the previous courses here simply remember g 1 acts when the coherence is positive p is plus 1 single quantum coherence then it will become g 1 into gamma c. In the second gradient acts when the single quantum magnetization is p is equal to minus 1 the coherence transfer path is minus 1 then multiplying with this it will become g 2 into minus gamma it, and if I have to maintain a particular coherence pathway for HSQC the sum of this gradients phase induced because of this gradient must become 0 that means g 1 into gamma c minus g 2 into gamma h should be equal to 0. If I gamma ratio I know between proton and carbon is 4 I put this value for gamma. Now, if I have to maintain ratio of g 1 and d 2 for carbon 13 it is 1 is to 4 if I make 1 is to 4 this becomes 0 g 1 should be 4 times then this is 1 then it becomes 0. So, proton should be 1 times gamma carbon should be four, uh, carbon this uh, gradient pulse for carbon should be 4 times same way for nitrogen 15 like this when you do this experiment this is called anti echo experiment and when we do this we select when we once n peaks other other time p peaks and then when we do this experiment applying the gradient once 4 is to 1 once it 4 is to minus 1 that means we select n peak and p peak it is called echo onto echo method we collect the signal by doing this and do the coding this is what happens look at the this thing this is a first experiment without suppression with phase with phase cycling and this is the gradient see the advantage in the phase cycling there is some disturbance here not completely suppressed there is artifact but in the gradient C 12 version C 12 attached proton signal is completely suppressed this is an advantage. So, parent signal coming from carbon 12 is suppressed efficiently by pulse field gradients. So, this is an experiment which is done and then HSQC is recorded. So, I am going to I have time is up I am going to stop here. So, what uh, we discussed today we discussed extensively about HSQC experiment I told you what is an HSQC experiment what is HSQC pulse sequence how it works we discussed HSQC as I said we take the magnetization from proton give it to carbon and then take it back to proton and detect proton in between during the T 1 period I can apply 90 pulse to do the decoupling and I will detecting prior proton I do the carbon de decoupling. So, that I will get the car carbon de uh, decoupled proton spectrum. So, I can do the decoupling in both the sides both the dimensions. So, there and I showed you various ways of doing the decoupling we can have decoupling the f 1 dimension or f 2 dimension or one of them or both none in both the dimension or both the dimension decoupling varieties of possibilities are there. But major problem comes in the HSQC experiment is parent signal coming from the carbon 12 attached proton or n 14 attached proton this we have to suppress by two uh, phase two phase, sec phase cycling 
with a tuple sequence. Once we do plus x and we do minus x, corresponding you invert the receiver phase and quad the data, you will supply the C12 peak. That is not very efficient, but we will the, use the gra gradient method and the gradient we know how to calculate which should be 1 is to 4 for carbon and 1 is to 10 for nitrogen and proton. And then once we apply a positive gradients for uh, once uh, other time we apply a negative gradient and then we collect n peak or p peak it is echo anti echo method we adapt again quad the data then you will suppress the efficiently. And I showed that gradient method is better suppresses the carbon 12 peak parent signal compared to nitrogen 15. So, with this I am going to stop today and in the next class we continue with this HSQC and afterwards we will go to a different 2D experiment. Thank you very much.